And then I'm going to tell you what you just heard. I hope you realize what you just heard. You got you got four years of Bible college right there. And enough truth to help you along the way, help us along the way. I needed to hear that, preacher. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was I, I, I'm wondering what in the world I'm doing up here, but I'm thankful. I, I pastored a little while, and then I used to say the Lord delivered me from pastoring, but I changed it to this, the Lord delivered those people from my pastoring. <laughs> and he put me back in evangelism because he knew they couldn't take much more <laughs> of what they had. But they, my people were so good to me, and i so thankful for the times the Lord let me pastor. But I've been in evangelism for a good while, and I thank the Lord for that. And I'm glad to be here. There's a lot of fellas here I know and love, and I'm thankful to be part of the meeting. Um, I had a real pretty outline that I was working on, and uh, the Lord kind of tossed it out the window on the way here. So I want you to go. We're just going to try and follow the Lord. I want you to look with me in First Samuel chapter number 28, 1 Samuel chapter number 28, and if I understood right, we got, are we having fried chicken tonight? Oh, Chick-fil-A, amen. All right, let's bow our heads and be dismissed. No, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, so I got seven minutes, all right, good. 1 Samuel chapter 28, I'm going to have to read a little bit of scripture, and we'll look at several passages. Thank you, preacher, for inviting me to come. Verse 1, it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men went with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. What sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. 
because thou obeyedest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord does this, done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel in the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along in the earth, and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had not eaten. He had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. And the woman came unto Saul, saw that he was sore troubled, and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice. I have put my life in thy, my hand, and have hearkened unto thy words which thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid. Let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, compelled him, and he hearkened unto their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. The woman had a fat calf in the house. She hasted, killed it, took flour, kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, that they did eat. Then they rose up and went away that night. I want to use this passage and several others for just a few moments tonight. And I'm going to pray, and then I want to preach on this subject, going for help to the gate of hell. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight because you first loved us. Lord, I am so thankful for what I got to hear tonight and what you did for me in my heart. And Lord, I could go home tonight and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm thankful for the fellowship of believers. I'm thankful for the good songs of Zion, the preaching of the word of God. I thank you for these men of God that are here gathered together, young and old, folks that love you and want to serve you. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to be a help to them tonight. Lord, get glory out of what takes place in these next few moments. Please, Lord, don't leave me to myself. I pray you help me in Jesus' name. Lord, get glory unto thy name. And if you get glory, we'll get help. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You could be seated. We find a man here we are familiar with in our Bible. His name is Saul. And we have a very unusual and, to my way of thinking, absurd scene in the Bible. One fellow said this. He said, the actors in the scene are Saul, the witch, and Samuel. They are interesting because one of them is dead, Samuel. One of them will soon be dead, Saul. And one of them is trafficking with the dead, the witch of Endor. Here in this passage, Saul is so afraid. He is so afraid because the enemy is upon him and he doesn't know what to do. And I want us to think for a moment and see how he got in this mess that he's in. It is such an absurd scene to think about it. The man who was head and shoulders, the Bible said, above all the men of Israel is now lying prostrate before a witch. The man who is to be the leader of God's holy people has now led two men down to the house of a witch. The man who received counsel from the likes of Samuel and the likes of David is now going down to the mouthpiece of hell to get counsel. How are the mighty fallen? And how far can a man fall when he gets out of the will of God? I do not want to end up like Saul. I do not want to end up where Saul is. I'd like to finish well. So I'm looking at this passage and I'm thinking about how Saul got where he is. The Bible said, back in the Old Testament earlier, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. The Bible had said in Leviticus, he shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy and have served or severed you from other people that ye should be mine. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. The Bible's pretty clear about that. 
But here is Saul, the leader of Israel, the man that God chose to be king over Israel, bowing at the feet of this witch. And he's come to get help from her. To find out what to do. To get advice. To get counsel. How does a man go from where Saul began to where he ends up? How does it happen? I want us to think of three things tonight from the life of Saul. I want you to notice, first of all, that Saul had, in the beginning, abundant help. There was help from every direction for, the, for this man, for this king of Israel, for this chosen man. If you go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 9, we'll read a little bit about God installing Saul as the king over the nation of Israel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we find this young man. The Bible said in verse 1, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamin, a mighty man of power. Did you hear that? A mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Now listen to the description. A choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upwards he was higher than any of the people. So we've got a man starting out. God is going to choose him to be king over Israel. The Bible said he's a goodly young man. The Bible said nobody goodlier than him. Higher than any of the people. Taller than anybody. Here is a man that you would look at him and you'd say that guy's got potential. That man could do something. He was probably something like how Samuel felt when he went down to Jesse's house to anoint a king and he looked at Eliab and said, surely this is the one that God has chosen. Saul was that kind of man to look at him. He had everything that a man would need to be the king of Israel seemingly. He had a regard for the man of God. He will say later when he's with his servant looking for the asses that are lost, he'll say, Behold, in this city there is a man of God. Saul knew enough about God to recognize if someone was a man of God or not a man of God. Saul was a man and he was humble in the beginning. The Bible said when they went to anoint him to be king, I believe it's in the next chapter or two, they went to anoint Saul to be king. They could not find him. And the Bible said they had to inquire of the Lord. And the Bible said he had hid himself among the stuff. I take that to mean that Saul did not think much of himself. And so he, I can see him saying, they're going to make me king. They want to anoint me to be king. I'm not king material. That's the way he felt. God help us if we ever feel like we're preaching material. If we ever feel like God got some kind of bargain when he got us. If we ever do anything for God, it'll be because of God and not because of us. It'll not be because we were goodly. It'll not be because we were choice. It'll be because a God in heaven put his hand upon us and did a work in us. Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. He said, God did it. God did it. If you ever think you did it, you're done. God did it. God did it. Huh. He had abundant help. You say, preacher, where did his help come from? Well, it looks to me like he had help from heaven. God chose him. God picked him out. The God of glory handpicked him to be king over Israel. I'm glad to be picked by God. Our brother talked about a call. I was in a meeting with my friend, Brother Billy Goulds, before he went on to be with the Lord. And a man got up to preach and he said, I never, got, I never, was, I never was called. I just, felt like a, I just felt like there was a need. And I sit next to Brother Goolsby and I'll never forget as long as I live what he said. He said, then sit down and let me preach. I'm called. I believe in a calling. You believe in a calling? I believe God calls a man to the ministry. I didn't decide one day that I felt like preaching. I didn't decide. I didn't look in 
Formula One ads and the classified ad and say, you know, I, I'm tired of doing this and that. I think I'll try this preaching thing. I'm going to tell you what happened. I was sitting in a service one day and I was sitting next to my wife in that service and a man was up preaching a message called When God Set Your Barley Fields on Fire and God been dealing with my heart about preaching and I'd been saying no and that man in the pulpit said, if you don't say yes to God, whatever he's telling you, he's liable to set your barley fields on fire and he said your barley field might be sitting beside you in the pew and I looked over at my wife and I went to the altar and said, Lord, you want me to preach? I'll preach. If that's my barley field, God called me. He put me in the ministry. I don't know why. You listen now. It was just him. And God put Saul in the place he was in. He had help from heaven. He not only had help from heaven, he had help from a holy man. A man named Samuel. Samuel was a man of God. Even Saul knew it. He said, Behold, in this city there is a man of God. You know what ought to be? That ought to be able to be said of every city in America. There ought to be in every city a man of God. There ought to be somebody even the drunkards know is a man of God. Every lost man knows is a man of God. They may not like what the man of God does. They may not care for the man of God. They may not exalt the man of God. They may not even listen to the man of God. But they ought to at least know there's a man of God. I hope there's a man of God in your city. Wouldn't you like to be that man of God? Behold, in this city there is a man of God, and he's an honorable man, and all that he saith cometh to pass. That's where it ought to be. There was a holy man named Samuel, and Samuel was a great help to Saul. Samuel gave Saul advice. Samuel gave Saul counsel. Samuel was the man that Saul could depend upon. And I would say this to you and I that are older preachers. Uh, there are young preachers that need us. They need to be able to, they need to be able to listen to us, to look at us. I'm, you say, preacher, are you exalting yourself? No. I just, I just thought to myself, Brother Willis got up and preached. Man, if you didn't get some help from that message and the, the things that he's seen and the places that he's done that God has done in his life, uh, young fellow, you ought to get around somebody like that and listen to what the man of God has to say. Samuel was his helper. He had help from heaven. He had help from a holy man and he even had help from someone in his own home. There was a young man named Jonathan who tried to help his daddy. And when his daddy had trouble, when his daddy got jealous of David, when his daddy heard them sing the songs that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, and Saul heard it and he said, they've ascribed to him, they've ascribed ten thousands to me, they've ascribed the thousands, and what can he have, what more can he have but the kingdom? And the Bible said he eyed David from that day and forward, and he wanted to kill David, but you remember, you remember that Jonathan took up for David. Jonathan said, why? What evil hath he done? He's never tried to harm you. It's good to have some help in your home. I thought about my sweet wife. We've been married. We're working on a 44th year of marriage. And uh, for 30 years of those of that marriage, we never owned a home that didn't have wheels under it. In fact, for a little while, about maybe a, a year or so, our home was a 1976 Volkswagen Rabbit. That was the only home we had. We stayed wherever we could. You know what she's never said to me in all those years? Never one time. She said, I wish we'd settle down somewhere. I wish we'd get a house somewhere. I wish we'd have a home like other people have. He never, she never said that one time. You know what she's always said? Just do what God would have you do. Just go where God would have you go. I'm going to tell you something, friend. If you got a godly wife, you ought to thank God for her. You ought to treat her like a queen. You ought to love her. You ought to love her like Christ loved the church. As a matter of fact, you got an ungodly godly wife. You ought to love her like Christ loved the church. I believe we're commanded in the Bible. But if you got a godly wife, you ought to thank God for her and tell her that you thank God for her and show her how much you love her. Amen. He had help from home. Jonathan had tried to help Saul with this matter of David. So here is a, here is a man, Saul. He got a lot of help. Can I tell you this? In your Christian life and in your ministry, you're going to need a lot of help. I was raised in Michigan. Go blue. 
I was raised in Michigan. We used to say, you need help. Now I went down and preached in Tennessee, and the preacher got up and he said, the Lord helped me. He said, I got some help. And then I got in North Carolina, and this little, this little white-haired saint from up in the holler said, I got hoping. I don't know you call it hoping, you can call it helped, you can call it help, but you're going to need some. You're going to need some along the way. I'm glad there's help from heaven. Amen. I'm glad he's an ever-present help in a time of need. Amen. I'm glad he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm glad he knows what I need before I know I need it. I'm glad that he answers before I ask. I'm glad he's been there every time. I've needed his help. Thank God for help from heaven. And then I'm thankful for help from holy men. Man, I think about the men God has allowed me to be around. I went down to Calvary Baptist Church in Cocoa, Florida, and Brother Donnie Pollard was the pastor, and Brother Billy Kelly was preaching, and Brother Billy Goolsby was preaching, and some other great men of God. And I remember one night I was pastoring a little church, and I had brought a fellow down there with me who had who had been unfaithful to his wife, and I went and found him where he's living. In the, I was past this little church just getting started now, and I went and found him where he was living with this harlot that he'd met down at work, and I, I got him out of the house, and I went and got him, and I went and got his wife and we were going to Florida to the meeting and I, he said, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to Florida and you're going with me. I said, pack your duds and get in the car. And so we drove down to Florida to that meeting at the Calvary Baptist Church and we got down there and, and I'm telling you, the preaching got hot, it got good, it got holy and it was more than he could stand and he got in his car and left. And left his wife with us. And I looked at her and she looked at me and she said, I got peace. And I thought, I'm glad one of us does. I don't have no peace about this. And I remember going to Brother Goolsby's room in the middle of the night, knocking on the door. Him and Miss Goolsby were in the bed. I knocked on the door. He said, who is it? I said, it's Brian McBride. I need help. He said, come on in, son. He got up, opened that door. He's in his robe. He went back, both of them, in the bed, covered up by the covers. He said, sit down here. I sat down in that chair by that bed. He said, tell me what's going on, son. I started telling him about the situation I was in. Man, he got to praying. He got to talking to God. He got to telling me what God could do in that situation. When I got there, I was sunk. I was done. But when I left, I said, hallelujah. I believe God's going to work this out. You know what? I got some good help from a holy man of God. I learned some things from those holy men. I remember Brother Kelly. By the way, that man got back with his wife. <laughs> he came back about three days later. He said, Preacher, I need to find my wife. I miss her so bad. i got to get this thing straightened out. I learned this from Brother Kelly. One day we were talking. Brother Kelly, we were talking about different things that had gone on. You don't mind if I reminisce a little, do you? Talking about different things that were going on. And, uh, and he said, Yeah, he said, One day I had a flat tire on the interstate. I said, what'd you do? He said, I got out of the car. I got the jack out and laid it next to the car. And I went and laid down in the ditch and went to sleep. I said, you went to sleep? He said, I laid down in the ditch and went to sleep. I said, what do you mean you went to sleep? He said, son, I knew God was in control of this thing. He said, I just laid down and went to sleep till somebody stopped and fixed the tire. And you know what happened? Somebody stopped and fixed the tire. He said, Preacher, what you learn from that? Well, I'll tell you, I won't tell you the whole story and all the details, but I had a need come up in my life, and it was going to cost me about 17 grand to get that need met. And I thought about this, and I said, I'm going to sell this, and I'm going to sell that, and I'm going to raise this, and I'm going to raise that. And then I thought about, I think the Holy Ghost reminded me, I thought about Brother Kelly laying down going to sleep on the side of the road. I said, Lord, I think this is what I'll do. I think I won't sell anything. I think I won't raise any money. I think I'll just... I think I'll just go about my business and I'll just, I'll just lay down in the ditch and go to sleep and let you take care of it. And about a month later, I got a phone call and guess what? It was all taken care of. I learned that from the man of God. Thank God for holy men of God that help us. Thank God for that old preacher man where you are. Who one day pulled you aside and said, Now, son, let me help you with that. Let me tell you about that. I remember Brother Kelly telling one time about preaching. 
He said, I was preaching, I was preaching in a big way. And he said, I looked out in the congregation. He said, I saw this woman. He said, she had her hair all fixed up. And, and this was the word he used, like a floozy. And he said it was parted down the middle and covered half of her face. And he said it just didn't look right to me. It looked floozy. And he said, I made up my mind. I was going to fit that in that sermon. I was going to nail her in that service. He said, I'd made up my mind. I was going to make it fit in the sermon. And so he said, I got ready to lambaste it. And the Holy Ghost said, leave that alone. I said, what would you do, preacher? He said, I left that alone. He said, after the service, we was having fellowship. And I noticed that lady, and she went like this. And the whole right side of her face was scarred and burned. And the reason she wore her hair hanging over that is because she's embarrassed by that. And you know what I learned? I learned you let God handle some things. You let God handle some things. Thank God for holy men of God. And thank God for the, the help that we have in our home. He had abundant help. But here's the second thing I want you to see. Not only abundant help, but I want you to see abandoned help. Do you know what Saul did? He abandoned the help that God gave him. We might use this word, he abused it. He didn't take advantage of it. He didn't listen to it. You know what his problem was? He got haughty about his help. We found him, if we look at the Scripture, we'd found him when they were going to anoint him king and he's hiding amongst the stuff. But then later on in chapter 15 when he's supposed to be doing the will of God, here's what we find. Samuel comes looking for him and the Bible said of Saul, he said, where is Saul? And here's what the man said to him. He said, he hath set him up a place. Now, if you look up that word place, it means a monument. It means a memorial. And what Saul had done, that man who was so humble at the beginning, Samuel will say to him in that chapter, when thou wast little in thine own sight, he said there was a time you didn't think as much of yourself as you do right now. There's, there was a time when you thought you weren't something, but now that has all changed, and you're going around setting up monuments to yourself and building towers for yourself and building up a place so everybody know who you are and know what you've done. You know what he did? He abandoned his help through haughtiness. He got, he got to. That's what my aunt used to say. You get a little too bit big, too, little too big for your britches, aren't you? He thought of himself more highly than he ought to. Hey, dear man of God, let's remember who made us. If we're anything, let's remember who made us what we are. If we're anywhere, let's remember who brought us where we are. If anything's been accomplished, let's remember who was it that did the accomplishing. I remember one time, and I know you're not this carnal, but I was preaching one time, and I'm going to tell you, we had a service. Man, did we have a service. And I wasn't doing it visibly, but in my heart I was patting myself on the back. I thought, man, that message did something tonight. I know you've never been that carnal. But I come out of the pulpit and this little white-haired lady come walking up to me. She said, Preacher, I stayed up all night last night and prayed for you and prayed that God would put His power on you and prayed that the Holy Ghost would move in hearts and prayed that life... And she kept telling me all the things she prayed. And the Lord said to me, I could have done with a three-year-old what I did with you in that pulpit. It had nothing to do with your ability. It had nothing to do with your outline. It had to do with a little saint of God who got in the prayer closet and got a hold of God. Thank God for help. But don't get so haughty that you can't... Appreciate the help that you get from heaven. If anything gets done, God's going to have to do it. He not only got haughty, he got half-hearted. Because in chapter 15, God sent him down to slay the Amalekites. He used to leave nothing left alive. Nothing breathing. But Saul had a better idea than God. Saul thought he knew more than God. So when Samuel showed up, Saul looked at him and said, Oh, thou blessed of the Lord, I performed the word of the Lord. And Samuel went, What meaneth then this 
bleeding of the sheep I hear. There must be breath in something. I can hear the sheep bleeding. I can, I can hear the cows mooing. And, and Saul said, well, we kept the best. God didn't tell him to keep the best. God said, slay them all. He said, I remember what Amalek, I'm going to get it right in a minute. I remember what Amalek did to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And he said, they're going to pay for that. You've got to wipe them out. They're going to be trouble. I don't want to leave anyone alive. And you know what happened. You know this just like I do. It was an Amalekite that slew Saul on the end of his days in that battle. He did not do what God said. He got half-hearted in the things of God. He said, preacher, how do you end up at the witch's house? You get haughty. And you get half-hearted in your service for the Lord. And then thirdly, he got hostile toward those that tried to help him. Because when you get back to it, that's what happens to you. You get angry at the people trying to help you. You get hostile at the people who have your best interests at heart and they'll come to you with a word from God or a word of wisdom and you'll get angry and you say, who do they think they are trying to tell me how to live? I, God put me in this ministry and I, God called me to preach and I'm the preacher man. And who do they think they are? I'll tell you who they think they are. They're trying to help you. But you know how angry Saul got? He threw a javelin at his son Jonathan. Tried to stick him to the wall. Tried to murder his own boy. Because he got hostile. So we've got an abundant help. That's what happened. That's how it began. Then there's an abandoned help. And then we end up where we are. Someone say, preacher, I will never sink that low. I'll never bow down at the feet of a witch. I'll never get there. I think if you'd asked Saul, that's what he would have said. I'll never sink that low. I'll never go that far. You get haughty, you will. You get half-hearted about the things of God, you will. You get hostile when God tries to correct you, and you will. So now he's down there. He, you, you know what the Bible said? He said, he said God won't answer him. can't hear from God oh my I know there are times in our life when God is silent because he's teaching us things somebody said one time talking about testing that the, the teacher never talks to you while you're taking the test and I know sometimes there is a silence of God there was a silence of God Toward his son when he hung on the cross. Some people call it the word of abandonment. I like to call it the word of abiding because even when he couldn't hear from God, he started quoting what God had said. He couldn't get a word from the Lord, so he started repeating the Lord's words that he's already heard. He started quoting the 22nd Psalm. You say, preacher, what should I do if I feel like God is silent? Start telling God what he said to you before. Start quoting it. Start bringing it up. Abide in that word. But I'm going to tell you, I don't want there to ever come a time when God said, No more. No more. I've talked and I've talked and I've talked and I've talked. No more. Here is Saul. He's facing an enemy. They're all around him. They're outnumbered. They're outmanned. They're outgunned. And there's no place to get any help. So what does he do? He finds him a woman with a familiar spirit. He can't get help from heaven. He can't get help from a holy man. He can't get help from home. So he goes to get help from hell. The very mouthpiece of hell. A witch. And he bows down at that witch's feet. And I thought to myself, if we look at this scene, it's a scene filled with hypocrisy. Because this is the man. Even the witch says it. She tells the truth. She said, you know what Saul has done? He's had all those familiar spirits and the sorcerers and the wizards. He's had them all put to death. But now the man who commanded all of them to die has sought one out. How had the mighty fallen? 
There is humiliation. The man who was called of God. Now the only person he can talk to is a witch. A woman with a familiar spirit. And it's a scene of helplessness. And hopelessness. Here's a man that God chose to be the king over Israel. But because of his sin, because of his pride, lifted up in pride, because of his half-heartedness, doing a halfway job at what God told him to do, and because of his, his hostility, he has found himself where there is no help for him. I don't ever want to get there. You say, preacher, was this really Samuel? I won't argue with you about it. You, you figure it out. I believe it was Samuel. I don't believe that she brought him up because when she saw him, she was surprised. And she yelled. She wasn't expecting to see Samuel. But Samuel told Saul what the situation was. I would like to say to you tonight... I would like to say to you that the story has a happy ending, but it doesn't. There are happy endings in the Bible, and maybe sometime Lord will let me come back and preach one with a happy ending, but there isn't one here. Because sin seldom, if ever, has a happy ending. It ends with Saul finding out he's going to die the next day, and it ends with him dying. That's because of his sin. I have on my mind tonight, and I, I won't mention any names, but I have on my mind tonight a young man who came to our church. I've been a member. I've been a member of the Bean Blossom Baptist Church for forty some years. My pastor's been the pastor for fifty one years, and I remember a young man who s- surrendered to evangelism, came out of a good Bible college mentored by a good man and he came to our church and we fell in love with him we just loved him he he uh, he came as an evangelist to preach he mowed the lawn he trimmed the bushes he would do anything you'd ask him to do and we loved him we took him on for support supported him monthly in the work of evangelism Somewhere along the line, something happened. I remember he got out of evangelism, took a church. My pastor tried to contact him because we were still supporting him, but he never would return the phone call. We just went on supporting him because we didn't know what he was doing for sure. But he never would call back. And I think it was because he wanted to keep getting the money. Finally, the church dropped him. He'd, he'd written some books about false prophets. Just recently, he went on television, sitting beside and endorsing one of those false prophets that he had written the books about. You said, Preacher, how does that happen? It could happen to any one of us if we become haughty and lifted up in pride. If we become half-hearted about holiness and righteousness and resort to half measures to do the will of God. And if we become hostile. I can't get over this scene tonight of the man of God, the King of Israel, down at the feet of a witch I can't get over it Lord help us never to get there help us never to look for help from hell but find all of our help from heaven and from the God who saved us and the God who called us help us never to get there tonight I want you to bow your heads a moment.
could be tonight in your life there's some things that don't belong there. Could be tonight there's some resistance against what God has told you to do. Could be tonight there's some pride. Our brother talked about bitterness. Could be tonight there's some hostility. I don't know. Could be tonight you've gotten half-hearted. This is what Paul, this is what landed Saul where he was. Let's beg God tonight. Say, Lord, don't let me ever get there. Let me find all of my help in Thee. All of my hope in Thee. Help me to be surrendered unto Thee. Help me never to get where Saul got. Lord, help me tonight. Keep me close to You. Work on my heart. I don't ever want to get to the feet of that witch. Help me, Lord. Father, help us tonight. Help your people. Help us determine, Lord, that by the faith of God, the help of God, and the grace of God,